chapter 7. Um, just a real quick, uh, I guess, programming note, if you will. Um, on Sunday nights, uh, starting this Sunday night, um, we'll turn our attention to the book of Mark as well. As you know, many of you have been working through our, uh, uh, Mark in our Sunday school hour, our morning, Sunday morning Bible study. Um, we're kind of jumping around. And uh, um, so we're going to try to fill in some of those gaps on Sunday night. So like, let's say this week, you know, we're in chapter 7, and I think in the upcoming week, we're maybe in 8 or 9, I have to look again. Uh, but we'll, uh, on Sunday night, kind of fill in what some of those, those narratives that we miss. So I encourage you to come back on Sunday night, 6 o'clock, uh, be a part of our Bible study as we continue to work through the book of Mark. As you're turning there to Mark 7, starting in verse uh, 24, I want you to think about uh, some awkward conversations that you've had in your life. Don't, probably don't need to dwell there, but... Uh, you know, sometimes when we speak, we, we say things we probably shouldn't have said. Uh, you know, sometimes they happen within our own households. Sometimes they happen out in the general public, if you will. Um, you know, uh, and I think people mean well when they say this to you, but sometimes people say, man, you look, you look tired. You're like, oh, thanks. Is that noticeable? You know, that usually means I look really bad and <laughs> why I'm out in public. You know, <laughs> uh, I know people mean well. Uh, uh, or, or, and this is always a struggle, okay? This, just being very transparent with you as your pastor, okay? Um, it's always a struggle to, to talk to people if they've lost weight. Because you don't want to go, wow, you've lost a lot of weight. You don't want to do that. That usually doesn't come off well. Uh, you know, it's usually better, wow, you're shrinking. Maybe that's better, but maybe that's not even appropriate. Uh, you know, there's different ways to, to navigate that. Um, you know, you know, probably, and I'm not saying this about my wife at all, so, you know, whatever. But, guys, it's probably not best to say to your wife, you're going to wear that? This, that's probably not good. That's not, that's not good. Uh, take a note, Jack, okay? Don't ever say that kind of stuff. Jack, he never says anything wrong, that guy over there. So, um, I was thinking about this, all the awkward conversations I've had in my life, and there's been plenty. I've lost track of them. Uh, then I got to thinking, what are some things that were maybe more cultural specific, maybe to the South? Uh, some things that would, could solicit awkward conversations or, or awkward uh, responses. And, and this, is some th- this is what people outside the South think, so I think this is kind of funny. Uh, when you bring up the fact that Miracle Whip and mayonnaise are the same thing, is that an awkward conversation? Darren kind of looks at me like, I don't even know. Some of you are like, okay, maybe not. Patsy says no. Okay, we're okay if Patsy's giving us a no. What about this? What if you're out of the restaurant? I know we've never faced this here, and they ask you if unsweet tea is okay. Oh, that's how that's <laughs> Sonia's face turned. Or, or for us at our family, if we go somewhere, uh, Alara will ask, uh, what, what kind of drinks do you have? Do you have Coke products? And say, oh, we have Pepsi. Oh, that's like the, the death nail for that place. We'll never be back. We'll never be back. <laughs> so, sorry if you're a Pepsi drinker. We're not trying to discriminate, but Coke is better. Uh, but, <laughs> but we think about it, there's, oh, okay, I got the thumbs up. Uh, we think about it, we have all kinds of awkward conversations on a regular basis. You know, we're reading the Bible, we don't usually expect to find those, but we do. There are some tough things that Jesus says to people where it takes us a moment to maybe wrap our mind and maybe even our heart around that. And we look at this passage here in Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 24. We have one of those awkward things that Jesus says. And I hope today as we spend time examining it, you'll, you'll see what he's trying to communicate. So in Mark chapter 7, starting in verse 24, talking about Jesus and his disciples. And it said, From there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know. Uh, Yet he he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard heard of him and came and fell at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go on your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in a bed, and the demon gone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, Lord, your scripture. And Lord, how each time we come to it, Lord, you speak. So, Father, I pray today as we look to this passage in Mark and we look at Jesus' interaction with this woman, which is an awkward interaction, we see your truth. We're confronted with it. 
We're confronted with the fact that you care for all people. And we're confronted with the fact that you desire for us to trust you. You desire for us to have a, a faith that is unwavering in you. So I pray today as we examine this passage and reflect on um, or what you're trying to, or what you are saying to us, or may our hearts be changed and may we be drawn to you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Today I've entitled today's message, Dogs of Faith. And you see, uh, as we've read through this, you know why it's entitled that, this awkward comment that Jesus makes to this Syrophoenician woman, essentially calling her a dog. But as we... Uh, work through it, I pray that you'll see that he was testing her faith. We'll talk about a tested faith as well as a rewarded faith. Now, this is a, has its parallel in Matthew chapter 15. This is one of those uh, accounts in the Gospels that we don't see everywhere else. So we don't see in, in, uh, in Mark, as, or excuse me, that we don't see in, in Luke and in John as well, but we do see it in Matthew. And, and we'll lean into that a little bit for some more additional details as we work through it. You know, from your Sunday school perspective, you know, one of the themes I think for today was that Jesus extends mercy to all people. And we see this clearly here because this is a woman that is, she's not a Jew. She's someone that's outside, if you will, the covenant relationship or what's appear or is thought to be the covenant relationship of God's people. So as we're looking to our passage, we, we see on the onset that Jesus is, he's, he's spread pretty thin. Uh, as we noted last week with the feeding of the 5,000 um, that uh, the popu- his popularity had grown to a point where he and the disciples couldn't go anywhere without a crowd. And uh, they were seeking to find a, a place to, to be where no one could find them or they could hide out for a little while. But sure enough, this lady finds them. In her desperation, she seeks out Jesus for help. Again, uh, taking a moment to ponder the fact that so often when we are... Um, whether we're doing the Lord's work or whether whether we're just living life, we feel like we've got to have downtime. We've got to withdraw and 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 not be around other people. But we see Jesus over and over again while he does indeed take times for solitude with prayer. But so often the needs of people are pressing upon him. And just as he said last week, he sees people as sheep without a shepherd. And he responds to those needs. But granted, his response in this situation is a little different. And as we work through it, hopefully you'll see what he's trying to accomplish. But we see this woman seeks him out. She's a Greek woman, or or I should say a Gentile woman. So she's not Jewish. And she comes from Tyre and Sidon, which is north of Galilee. So you you think about a biblical map. I know some of you have got one locked in your brain because you you think about it all the time. But at the very top of a a map of the Holy Lands or or, or Bible time lands, if you will, the land in Bible times. That's probably better said that way. Uh, Galilee, where Jesus hung out most of the time, is at the very north of that area. Well, Tyre and Sidon is even further north of that, along the coast. So we see that Jesus and his disciples are that far north. And they're, they're looking for a chance just to relax, take it easy, gather themselves. But this woman finds them. Now, the fact that she's from this neck of the woods, if you will, she's Syrophoenician, as it says here, she most likely participated in the worship of those type of gods. And those gods were, were Baal and, and Ashereth, those that were focused on the sun and the moon and, and fertility rites and things that were very um, physically driven in the way they worshipped uh, as far as uh, activities and, and really immorality. So this woman is likely a, a participant in those things. But as we see here, she has come to Jesus she's got a problem that her gods can't fix. She's got a problem that she cannot fix. In fact, if we look over at, at Matthew's Gospel in Matthew 15, 22, when she comes to Jesus, she makes this comment, Have mercy on me, O son of David. So she's gotten to the point where she's realized, again, her religious background's not working. The way she's approaching things is not working. So here in Matthew 15, we see that she's embracing this idea that this man, this Jesus, may be the Jewish Messiah. He may be the one my Jewish neighbors have talked about for long ago that would would come and bring peace, that would bring sight to the blind and rescue the downtrodden. This is him. He's the only one that can make a difference. So she comes to him in, in desperation. Because of the emptiness of her pagan worship. And honestly, it may be that her participation, I know this is an argument from silence, but it may be that her participation in this pagan worship, this cult worship, is what's brought along 
this demon into her family's life, what has brought along this demon possession of her, own, of her child, her little daughter. And here she is, not knowing what to do. But she's heard about Jesus. She's heard what He's done over and over again by exercising demons, by healing those that are sick. He's heard that He may be the Christ, the Messiah. And here she is, begging Him to interact, begging Him to act in her life. So what we see when Jesus encounters her, He tests the seriousness of her appeal. You know, she's there, she's begging, and, and as we look at both Mark's gospel and Matthew's gospel together, we see that she falls on her face, she, she begs him as the son of David uh, to, to do something here, to, to heal her child who is demon-possessed. If we look at Matthew's gospel, what, she do, what Jesus does is he gives her the silent treatment. He kind of ignores her. So you've got this woman that's, that's laying out her heart. She's begging. She's groveling. She's down on her knees. She's, she's down on her face, even. If you put the two accounts together, and Jesus kind of walks away, giving her the cold shoulder treatment. So much so that the disciples, that looking at Matthew's gospel, said, Jesus, I mean, she's, she's making a scene here. Why don't you send her away, Jesus? If, you know, if you're not going to do anything here, let's just send her on her way. And get her out of here, and then we can go on about our business again. We're tired. We've been you know, at this for a while. And then Jesus makes a comment here. It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now think about this for a moment. As we talk about awkward conversations, I don't suggest calling anyone a dog for that matter, okay? But here, that's what Jesus essentially does. This woman who is broken, she's, she's seeking Jesus for intervention in her daughter's life, in her life, to, to change their cir circumstance because she's realized nothing else can. And Jesus is kind of walking away from it. He's testing to see if she really believes he can make a difference. Then he makes this comment, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, understanding this context here, when he's talking about the children here, and many of you probably studied this this morning, he's talking about the Jews. You know, Christ came first for God's people, for His elect people that He had called out, or His special people He had called out, the Jews. Jesus is a Jewish Messiah, but yet we know His scope of redemption goes beyond that. It goes to all people. But it starts here with the Jews, the children, as He would say here. It's not right to take what was given to the Jews first and then to throw it to the dogs. Because within this culture, Gentiles were looked down upon. You know, I know many of you spent some time studying this over the years in your personal study as well as in classroom format. And, you know, a good Jew at this time would go out of his or her way to avoid Gentiles, to avoid Samaritans. Whether that meant they would go uh, take different routes to different places, go around areas, uh, not be in certain places at a certain time that these other people were. But we see Jesus throughout His ministry, He's not about that. But here in this comment, He's making a stark line of distinction. It's not good to give the children's bread to the dogs. Now real quickly, as a side note, as we see this word dogs here, uh, throughout the New Testament and throughout the Scripture, there's different uses of the word dog. There's the use of the word like a dog that is just a wild animal. Um, much like you'd see, uh, um, you know, and Jesus talks about the parable of uh, uh, the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus the poor man and how the dogs would come lick his sores, these wild dogs. Uh, most likely in, during the time of Jesus' crucifixion, wild dogs would be on the loose, and that would be part of the torment of uh, victims of crucifixion. Dogs that you did not want to pet. I remember in the some of the training that I went through um, getting ready to go to Africa and different places on mission, they said, there's going to be dogs everywhere you go. Don't pet them. Because they're, they're wild, crazy animals. And you don't know what could, could happen. They may let you pet them, or they could take your hand. You don't know. I remember the first time I went, I went with a gentleman that was a huge animal lover. Okay, He's always taking in animals. He's, he rescues animals, all these different things. And it just broke his heart that he couldn't go pet a dog that was in the streets of Africa. I was like, Rick, you can stop this. But then the other word that's used for dogs is like a small domestic dog. Here in this passage, we have that word, a small domestic dog, maybe even rendered puppy. Here, Jesus is saying, 
It's not right to take the children's bread, children's bread and throw it to the puppies or to throw it to the household dog. Now, I'll, you know, I guess comedic side of this, I, you know, as I'm working on this, and I'm thinking about it, and then I've got Samson at our house, who's, we've given up on training, I think he's training us, you know, that type of situation. Uh, I may need to bring Tom in for this, bring in the big guns. You know, trying to figure out, you know, he, he's the one that wants to get up on the table and eat your food, or puts it, he, he nuzzles up beside you and puts his, arm, his, uh, his, his nose right between your, your arm and your, your body and kind of nuzzles in there like he wants to eat. You know, it's not that type of situation. We've got a dog that's hiding up under the table that's just waiting for crumbs to follow, to fall. That's what's, what Jesus is explaining here. So he calls this woman a dog. He says, you're just, you're a puppy. And the bread is for the Jews. Now, at that response from Jesus, this one that she thought was the Son of God, the, the Messiah, he's treating her like this. He's giving her the silent treatment. Then he kind of throws this awkward comment at her. You know, if she were to get up and just walk away from it, thinking, well, this isn't the guy I thought he was, probably most of us go, well, you know, it's probably right the way he acted. But she doesn't give up. She persists in her faith. She persists in her request. In fact, that persistence reveals what she really believes about Jesus. Regardless of Jesus' apparent resistance, she continues. And she changes her posture. Uh, well, she continues that posture, I should say, of begging. And she says there, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She goes, I'll be fine with the crumbs. I just need you, Jesus. I just need you to make a difference in my daughter's life. If it's just the leftovers, that's fine with me. As long as it's you. As long as you're making a difference. As long as you're acting in my child's life. If you're intervening in my child's life. She's persisting because she knows that Christ is the only one that can make a difference. She's desperate. She's persistent. She knows that He has come to save the Jews, but she knows her and her child need that same salvation. And her child needs that deliverance now. So as we consider this first part of this interaction that Jesus has with this woman that He's called a dog, do we learn anything from her, persis her persistence? I guess the question for us is, how persistent are you in your faith? How relentless are you in pursuing what God has for you? Do you really believe that Jesus is the only one that can make a difference in your life? Do we expect Jesus to make a difference in our life? As we look at this woman, she's, she's hit rock bottom. Her child is demon-possessed. She can't do anything about it. She's tried it all, and now she's come to Jesus realizing He's her only hope, and she's not going to take no for an answer. Even if this one that she thinks is, can do it all, which He can, that can heal her, that can bring deliverance, all these things, even if He puts up a, 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 some resistance, she's still going to press through that because she needs Him. Do we approach our life that way? Do we seek the Lord with that type of desperation? Do we realize that He's the only one that can help us? He's the only one that can save us? I think for us, as we think about our salvation, we're probably, yes, Jesus is the only one that can save us from our sins. But when we live our everyday life, this morning, our foundations class, we're talking about the Lordship of Christ, allowing God to be the boss of our life, living under His authority, underneath His Lordship. That happens when we realize the only one that can really truly direct us in our life, that only can really lead us, is Him. So we need to pursue after Him in such a way that we realize He's the only one that provides guidance, wisdom, insight for life that, that, that can make a difference, that can, that can help us, that can empower us, that can give us that, that victory that we need to move forward. Or do we say, you know, we know that Jesus is the only one that can save us, but I think I can figure out my life. I can face this, this situation at work on my own. Or I can deal with this issue in my family all by myself. Or I can try to. Or, or we like this woman and say, I can't do it. Here it is, Jesus. And persist in that. 
expecting Him to work, expecting Him to, to bring change, expecting Him to reveal His glory in the midst of those circumstances. This woman's pushed away, essentially, and says, why would we give the, the children's bread to the dogs? She says, I'll take anything I can get, Jesus. I need you. Do we have that mentality? Do we have that posture of our heart that we need Jesus every day? It's only then that we really live a life that's submitted to Him. We realize that if it's left up to us, we're going to make a mess of it. We need Him every day. We need Him in the big things. We need Him in the small things. We need Him to reign over our life. We see how Jesus responded here to this woman. He kind of pushed her off, if you will, tested her appeal, tested her faith, by talking about her being a, essentially a dog, and says, I'll take the crumbs. And then what does Jesus say? He says, for this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home, and found the child lying in bed, and the demon had gone. Jesus saw her persistent faith. She saw that she was desperate, and He responded to her appeal. He saw that she truly understood He was the only one that could save her. She truly understood He was the only answer to this question that went unanswered for her for so long. And when that became a reality, he brought healing. In fact, we look in Matthew 15, Jesus says this, O woman, how great is your faith, when, he see, when she says this statement. Be it done as you desire. And at Mark, he says, go on your way, your daughter is healed. You know, as we consider this, uh, here, this miracle by distance, you know, our heart and mind may be taken to other incidences where we see that, where Jesus is encounter someone and they come to him like the, the Roman centurion and also a Gentile who comes to Jesus and says, my servant is ill. Uh, will you heal him? And Jesus says, well, I'm on my way. He goes, no, you don't even have to come to my house, Jesus. I know that if you say it'll happen, it'll happen. And sure enough, Jesus acknowledges how great his faith is. In fact, he says, there's no other faith like this among the Jews. And he heals the man's servant from a distance. Also, we see an official come to Jesus, similar circumstances, and says his son is sick. And wants Jesus to come with him, and Jesus says, if you believe, I'll heal him right here. And sure enough, Jesus heals him from a distance. Jesus realizing, or revealing, just his power and, and just his ability to, to change lives if faith is a, part of the, is a part of the equation. If we simply believe and trust that He's the one that can change things. He's the one that can make a difference. Of course, we understand that. Again, we think about our own situation. We think about our sin, and we understand that He's the only one that can rescue us from our sin. We, we can't do that on our own. We, there's no amount of good works. There's no amount of good deeds or righteous acts that we can do to, to wash away our sin. We understand that He's the only one that delivers us there. But then when it comes to everyday life, again, continuing to persist and submit to God and allowing Him to work in us, to reveal our faith, and then reward our faith by His actions, by Him bringing the answers that we desperately need. And sometimes those answers, as we've talked about in the past, and talking about the different healings that Jesus has done, may not be exactly what we're expecting. But it's His perfect response. Just as He brought healing to this young lady's life, this child's life, Jesus rewarded her persistent faith. So the question we have to ask ourselves once we're confronted with this, how real is our faith in Christ? Do we truly trust Him for all of our existence? Do we truly trust Him to forgive us of our sins? If we have, that means we are giving Him our life. And we expect Him, we acknowledge that He's the only one that can make a difference in who we are in, in our everyday life. He's the only one that can bring healing to, to us in, in our brokenness. He's the only one that can restore relationships. He's the only one that can take the tumultuous things of our life, those storms of life, and bring peace. This is this woman who would not give up 
because she knew Jesus was the answer. Even though she was called a dog, she was willing to do whatever just to get the crumbs because she knew that Christ was the only one that could bring hope to her hopeless situation. Here this morning, you may be struggling. Maybe struggling with hopelessness. Trying to figure out what the next steps in your life are. Trying to figure out how to how to, to begin to heal a, a broken relationship or, or how to, um, to navigate through a dark passage in your life. Just like this woman, come to Jesus. Persist in your faith. Jesus says, if you ask, it will be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened to you. But we've got to ask. We've got to seek. And we've got to knock. Are we willing to do that? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this, this example of a persistent faith. And so often as we look to Scripture, we find those examples to, that spur us on from unlikely places, as we do in the Syrophoenician woman. Lord, I'm so thankful for it. I'm so thankful that it reminds us that we are to be relentless in our pursuit. So Father, in that relentless pursuit, sometimes we get the quietness, and wondering if, if you've forgotten us, wondering if maybe you've abandoned us. But Lord, over and over again, your scriptures remind us that if we draw near to you, you'll draw near to us. So Father, I pray for some of us this morning, to, Lord, to throw off the shackles of their schedule or, or, or just the circumstances they find themselves in. And Lord, I pray that they'll draw near to you. And Lord, as they do, they'll be rewarded by sensing your presence in their life, be rewarded by seek, uh, you working in them in a way that only can be done by you. And Lord, for others of us in this room, Lord, that Lord, we know that we're trusting in you for our salvation. We know that you're our only hope. But Lord, we find ourselves living the day to day in our own power. Lord, forgive us. Help us to understand. Help us to realize. Help us to trust you and pursue you relentlessly knowing that you're the one that get, provides insight. You're the one that provides wisdom on how to, fight, how to face every day. For you call us to, be your, to serve you. Lord, you call us to submit to your lordship. So Father, help us to see what that looks like. Help us to see what it looks like to live in complete faith and trust in Christ. We thank you for your word and this time in it. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.